Tale from Tenth City by J.B. Stephen Connor Lewis was just an ordinary man before all of this. A very ordinary man with an aggravating habit of daydreaming and overthinking. And then the world had to go and end itself. Of all the things to destroy mankind, it had to be the sun. The thing Connor usually enjoyed most when he was able to escape from his job. His ordinary and stupid job that lay inside a very boring concrete building. Brutalist, obviously a building with windows so small that natural light could scarcely enter its halls. It was, in truth, excellent foresight on the part of the designer to prevent employees from seeing the outside world during work hours, so they might better tolerate the sterile interior, where their dreams could be crushed and their existential dread molded into a favorable disposition that promoted productivity. Every day at 4.30 p.m., the sun would always be there when he got off work, shining brightly even on a cloudy day. Its warm light would always provide him with some minuscule semblance of joy, away from the harsh and artificial light of the fluorescence that constantly gave him minor headaches. Any natural light at that point was welcomed, no matter how gloomy the sky was. And then, the sun had to go and shit all over the entire world. At least that's what he thought happened. As if his life wasn't miserable enough being stuck in a dead-end job working long days only to live for those two magical ones sandwiched between the five really long ones. God, his thoughts really went to dark places when he was by his lonesome. Ah, crap! He had been so lost in a thought tangent that his cigarette had all but burned away, leaving him with an extended and disappointing stump of ash that collapsed pathetically onto his hands. And that was his second last cigarette, too. God only knew how long it would be until the supply runners in the group found more packs. It was entirely possible that they might never find another pack of cigarettes ever again. Jesus, what if he had the only cigarette left in the world? Could he be considered a god among smokers? Well, you're the last one, Connor said, looking upon his last cigarette with genuine affection. I guess I should save you for some sort of special occasion, he mused, half-heartedly caressing the lone white shaft in his now mostly empty pack. Although, if we wait for something really good to happen, I don't think I'll ever get to smoke you. Connor sighed, shoving his pack into his jacket pocket, feeling slightly disheartened as he felt it collapse in on itself the deeper he pushed it inside. Today was guard duty, and everyone at some point was lucky enough to take part in it during their pre-scheduled day. Connor actually enjoyed it, only because it gave him some room to breathe from the confines of the cave where dozens of tents and their residents lay packed together like dumbstruck sardines in a can. As much as he liked the idea of camping, doing it inside of Tent City with over a hundred other desperate and miserable people was not his idea of a good time. Still, at the very least he was grateful to be with other people who were more focused on actually living out some kind of inconsequential existence than on flat-out killing each other. He had seen a lot of that before he found his group. Sure, there were lots of skirmishes and a few fistfights when Tent City was in its early stages, when people were trying to work out some sort of happy medium between fear and sadness. But things had settled down after about a month or so, with few major issues. People developed routines, and that helped to quell the gators a little bit. Speaking of gators, Connor liked to refer to people's inner demons as gators, because they were always needing to be fed to keep them from peeking their noses above the surface. Otherwise, things could get messy in their community. Everybody needed some kind of sinful food for their own types of gators. Right now, Connor's gators were rising to the surface, looking for the meal that he had promised them, only to foolishly let it burn out without even getting so much as a handful of puffs in. The next few days were going to be really shitty. Then, the bell rung. Great. Just when I was enjoying this disappointing clump of ash burning a damn hole in my hand. With a swift flick, he sent the last remnants of his cigarette flying into the tree line, a spectacular trail of sparks dotting the night sky as it tumbled into the darkness below. 
The toll of the bell meant there was to be a shift change, and that meant his guard duty was done and he could go home. Whatever the hell that meant. There was no such thing as a real home in Tent City, unless you were one of the three jerks who drove their motorhomes or trailers inside of the cave. There was a special place in hell for those people, the ones whose luxury vehicles still miraculously worked after it all happened. Many of the once wealthy individuals who were now part of the community had some growing pains to adjust to. It was pointless for them to brag about how many square inches they had in their tents, so instead they would often brag about the square footage they used to have in their suburban McMansions, which were likely now reduced to smoldering piles of rubble thanks to stellar, and Connor meant that sarcastically, build quality. Whatever. The privileged jerks in Tent City were all peons now. The apocalypse had rendered everyone more or less equal in misery, and money no longer had any real meaning. Now it was food and water. Basic needs. God, what he wasn't willing to do for a flush toilet. Or a nice big steak. Those were two very different things he suddenly mashed together into a single thought, but... Okay, sirrah, sirrah. That was guard duty. Huh? Connor had been so preoccupied reminiscing philosophically to himself that he almost ran straight into Malcolm on his way back through the caves. Mal was the lucky soul relieving him of his guard duty. Earlier than he would have thought. Oh, hey Mal. Sorry, I was in my own little world there. Connor almost laughed at how unlikely the situation would have been to run right into Mal. He was easily the largest man Connor had ever seen. Pretty hard to miss. Eh, guard duty was fine. Uneventful for the most part. Connor shrugged. Mal suddenly looked suspicious. Most part? Connor sighed. Uh, missing a crucial component of my diet, he responded feigning a cigarette puff with two fingers to his lips. Mal nodded. Serves me right for being a smoker when cigarettes suddenly become as valuable as goddamn diamonds. Mal chuckled. Well, those things will kill you anyway, he said, sounding as if there was something behind his statement that hit him personally. If Connor would have been honest with Mal, he would have told him outright that the climate would likely kill them all before they were old enough to die of cancer anyway. But he kept that part to himself. No one in this world needed any more doses of pessimism, especially in Tent City. Everyone was depressed enough, and if Connor had to look into the sad eyes of another lost child, he might just lose it for good. Thanks for the advice, Connor replied, pulling himself out of his thought hole. Enjoy yourself out there, buddy, Connor waved as he trotted back through the cave towards his tent. Mal was the sort of guy that mostly kept to himself. Connor, of course, had his theories as to why but he couldn't help but notice that Mal received strange looks wherever he went, likely due to his size and menacing demeanor. He was a solidly built and superbly tall man. Connor had always gotten along well with him. They both had the same level of intolerance for BS and weren't afraid to wear their hearts on their sleeves. You definitely never wanted to get Mal angry. The man could crush an elephant with his bare hands, but he was a genuinely nice and normal guy burdened with the unfortunate genetic traits of being impossibly tall with a perpetual resting bitch face. Connor had found it very easy to hang out with him. Anyway, people always tended to fear things larger than themselves. Foreign people. Other countries that had foreign people. A scientific understanding of the universe. Connor quickly shook his head, mentally disembarking the tangent train he nearly boarded to Digressionville. Just a heads up, called Mal as Connor suavely twirled about to face him. Dave's on the rampage again. Connor responded back with his usual cheeky salute in thanks as he twirled back around towards the cave interior. Oh, Dave. Dave was a real hard ass, the sort of jerk everyone in a large group uniformly regards with searing hatred through hushed voices, yet willfully acknowledges they absolutely need out loud. It was a love-hate relationship, and Connor mostly hated, with a dash of love. Dave was the organizer, the scheduler, the one with the spiked whip. So it was only natural that everyone hated their boss, Connor included. People were desperate, and they needed someone like Dave to keep a muzzle on the group. Though when Connor thought about the group, there truly was an overall sense of community structure, precarious as it sometimes felt. Perhaps the best way of describing the collective dynamic was by comparing it to a rubber band stretched slightly too thin, and everyone was trying to pluck a tune out of it. Of course, within the larger structure, there were smaller groups that tended to stick together, 
in essence making the whole a sort of microcosm of the fluid organism that used to be called society. Dave had managed to keep everyone together as a collective despite some infighting between the smaller groups. Connor knew there would be a day when the rubber band would snap, but he appreciated that Dave was working to prevent that from happening, even if Dave had to be a prolific dink about everything. Connor was grateful, in his own way, even if you would have to tie him down and do terrible things to get him to even admit that. Lewis! Connor froze mid-stride. What the hell do you think you're doing? Dave! Connor responded, slowly spinning around to see Dave's permanently beat red face glaring at him. Dave was constantly on the verge of blowing a gasket and had a penchant for calling people by their last names to, quote, avoid confusion. Dave's words, not his. Had Connor been on top of his game, he would have told Dave that clearly he had been walking and then would proceed to ask him what he thought he was doing. But there would always be time for facetiousness later. He really didn't feel like drawing this conversation out. Did Dave call siblings by the same name? Connor wondered. What can I do you for, Dave? Connor replied with feigned exuberance. He had almost made it to his tent without being seen. Almost. According to the time, Dave looked down at his wrist where there was no watch. You still have an hour left on your shift. Steam was now visibly rising from Dave's red ears. At least, according to Connor's overactive imagination, it was. Connor tried to fight the look of perplexity that was slowly developing on his own face. Did your invisible watch also hear the bell by any chance? Connor replied, smugly. There came the facetiousness. Dave snorted, folding his arms, then rubbing his nose because he had snorted slightly too hard. You started at ten o'clock. You've only been out there for two hours. Connor threw up his hands, shrugging. I was following your schedule, Dave. Connor had grown highly adept at pushing Dave's buttons. Mal even came to relieve me. What am I supposed to do? Connor enjoyed endlessly fueling Dave's ire. Perhaps he could even be accused of pouring a bit of gasoline on the already raging flames and dancing fervently around the blaze. It was all harmless fun. At least it was for Connor. Although he was certain Dave felt very differently. If Dave would only give up and cry, Connor could finally feel that his life's mission was complete, although he willfully accepted that it would be a terrible idea for the power play within their group to transform their leader into a giant man-baby. At this point in their relationship, Connor could have gifted him with a bottle of Dave's favorite whiskey, and he was sure Dave would still give him a lecture on how he also did not give him the proper glass to drink it from. Connor had decided to embrace the chaos that was often the result of their brief exchanges and then deflect that chaos with humor in order to keep himself from going completely insane. How about this, Dave? Connor said, gesturing much more than he had intended to. I'll do an extra hour during my next shift to make up for it. Dave squinted, pausing for a moment. Damn right you will, he said, pointing his finger at Connor. This ain't kitty playland, Lewis. We're actually trying to survive here. Connor's eyes figuratively rolled so far back into his own head that he could see his brain. And although he couldn't see his own face, he imagined he likely had the incredulous look of a small rabbit being chased around a yard by an annoying toddler. Yes, Dave, I understand, Connor replied, not at all in a mocking fashion, despite the way it came out of his mouth. What you need is a change in attitude, son, Dave began, arbitrarily pointing to the ceiling with his index finger. What Connor needed was a damn cigarette, but okay. Suddenly the warning alarm began to ring. Not the heat wave alarm but something else. At least it prevented Dave from rattling on into a sermon. Dave quickly spun around, his hands on his hips. What in God's name is going on now, Dagnabbit? He yelled out to no one in particular. Suddenly, Dave's right-hand man came running up to the both of them, his face the spitting image of a guilty puppy who had just eaten a sofa pillow. Sir! Oh, hey, Connor, smiled the young man, slightly out of breath. Hey, Pete, Connor replied, nodding slightly. Why was such a nice guy like Pete Samuels working for such a wiener like Dave? Connor would never know. But hey, better to rule with the devil than to, uh... How did that saying go again? Pete then turned back to Dave, clasping his hands together as if he was pleading. Sir, we got a problem. Dave made a slight gesture that, when followed through, surely would have resulted in a facepalm. You think? My ears work perfectly fine, dingus. 
There, in all its glory, was the divine creature that was Dave Foster, his usual prickish self. What exactly is the problem? Dave finally asked, after an awkward moment of silence between he and his squire. Dave was really frazzled now. It wouldn't be long before his left eye started to twitch, and he would begin mumbling incoherently to himself. Sir, we have a fire in the woods, just outside the north watch post, Pete replied, pointing to where Connor had just come from. Connor gulped, his eyes slowly widening. Lois! Dave raged, suddenly turning to Connor. Why in God's name didn't you report the fire? Connor swallowed hard, his hand invisibly caressing the last cigarette that rested within his jacket pocket. That's because I was, um... Connor was doing his damnedest to find some sort of excuse. Sleeping! God, that was a really terrible answer. Dave's head physically dropped. Jesus H. Christ, son! Just when I think you can't get any more... My fault! Connor cut him off mid-sentence before Dave had the chance to spill into a verbal diarrhea of insults and preachy statements. It will not happen again, sir. He could always tame Dave a bit by calling him sir. It was a bit like giving a hungry lion a bit of meat to prevent him from chewing your face off. Dave then proceeded to exhale some sort of vocabular noise that Connor assumed was meant to represent the upper limits of his pent-up frustration. I will deal with you later, Dave fumed as he strode off towards the watch post with Pete where Mal was likely having his own freakout session. Pete turned back to Connor as they walked, waving timidly. Connor could only return the gesture with an awkward half-wave, accompanied by a twitching smile. Connor again reached into his pocket, remembering the still apparently lit cigarette butt he casually tossed into the woods. There was only one word that could possibly formulate within his mind. One magical word that could fully express the shock and horror that was slowly contorting his usually sly, mischievous face as he watched Dave stomp off. Connor's lips pursed as he sucked back a long breath through his teeth. Mother f-